Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Peter. Okay. Chris will be alive and sober, part of a sacred place for Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, thank uh, James and Rachel for having me back. We did this about uh, maybe a year ago, and I'm back, and I feel like I never left. Um, so I've been asked to talk about uh, my experience with and hope with the 12 steps and what that's done for me and hopefully uh, has been able to uh, affect other people um, along the way. Uh, rather than infecting people with untreated alcoholism, I'm hoping that God has allowed me to affect people in a positive way uh, through the awakening of the spirit. Uh, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says years of living with an alcoholic will make any child or wife neurotic. The whole family has to some extent become ill. And that's what happens to me, drunk or sober, if I'm untreated. And go, even I'm going to meetings and um, uh, making coffee and setting up and breaking down, have a host of friends uh, without an awakened spirit. I'm still a drunk without a drink in me, untreated, and um, I can bring harm to others. And I have found from my own experience and countless others that uh, we and I can be more dangerous uh, sober than drunk. So um, I'm hoping um, that at some point uh, I'm of service to someone here. And uh, looking back, and I think I've been of service to others along the path here the last 25 years. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. And uh, I always like to share this, that I'm a recovered alcoholic, and I hope to stay recovered. And anything less than that would be falsely humble. And as a recovered alcoholic, I have a responsibility to uphold the traditions as well as the tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, It's not just about coming to meetings and doing my step work. It's about being an upstanding member and carrying the torch of the sacred fellowship. Now, Alcoholics Anonymous is a sacred fellowship. It is not a hangout, and I speak for myself. It is not a dating scene. It's a place where we get well and then go out and get the lost sheep and bring them back. We bring God's children back to him. And the only way I'm able to do that is if I'm not here and I'm completely out of the way, even for these talks, and uh, let God be the director and let me be his agent. And our big book tells us that he's the principal, we're his agents, which means I represent God in all I do and so do you, and what a great responsibility. And in order to do that, I must have a whole lot of power. We, as a fellowship, must have a whole lot of power, which means we're no longer powerless like contemporary and will tell us you're always going to be powerless, and that's a lie. We get power. We get God's power. It's just that we're not the power. And we get to go out and help others and bring them back to AA, and then which eventually, if AA is doing its job, we'll take them back to God via the 12 steps. My job is to carry the torch. My lineage goes right back to Dr. Bob, and I hope to never water down the sacred message that's been passed down generation after generation until I show up in 1988. So I'm a recovered alcoholic. Now, it doesn't mean I get to stay recovered on my own power and hang out and recover because I found out by watching others that the way we go forwards through the steps, I can go backwards through the steps. And the scary thing is, I don't even know I'm going backwards through the steps. I just start to drift away. And working with others is kind of like, uh, I give it name sir, lip service. I really don't have a sponsor who I'm accountable to. I'm not doing anything with the sponsor. I just have some friends I talk to, and I tell them what I want to tell them. And I'll tell you one thing and you another thing, but both of you guys don't know the whole story. I'm not doing any 12-step calls. I'm not even getting to that many meetings. And one of the first disciplines that we lose is the meditation piece. That's out the window. I have no line to review. I check in with God while I'm driving to work. I pray. So there goes that relationship. I'm not doing any kind of spot check during the day. My amends list is uncompleted. So there goes my eight-step list. Defects of character start to run the show. And I start to believe in this false sense of self. I start to believe I am what my defects tell me. And I start to see the world through the eyes of an alcoholic who's untreated, which means fear-based and insecure. I start to speak from that place, and I start to behave from that place. I'm not sharing anything with anyone. As far as turning it over, there's no such thing. I'm turning it over to me. How can I meet God? How can I experience God when I start playing God? All the insane ideas start to come back, and I start to experience untreated alcoholism. I go on these sprees. Now, you can't go on a spree, because that means you're untreated, but I can't. And my sponsees have to walk a straight line 
but I'm the sponsor and I can detour once in a while. So I start to go on sex sprees and some food sprees and some money sprees and a lot of fear sprees and a whole lot of thinking sprees. I'm obsessed with my thinking and I have the committee in the head that insists that I'm right and you're wrong. I find myself angry and irritable a whole bunch and uh, my life's now unmanageable. Still haven't picked up a drink yet. And unmanageability is trying to run the show, which means I have current agnosticism, which means I'm in self-reliance, which means I'm in a whole lot of fear, which means I'm trying to run the show. You get in the plays off each other. And suddenly AA is a real pain in the neck. And I hate when people confront me. And I don't like speakers. I don't like the people sitting next to me. In fact, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and I start to find nice little excuses not to come to an AA meeting. Like, I got to clean out the litter box. I can't go to home group. <laughs> Jeopardy's on. Championship round. I can't go to my home group. I'm tired. I worked all day. And I start to drift away. And then one day to get some relief, just to get some ease and comfort, I pick up a drink. But that's not the plan when I woke up this morning and I get drunk. Now, that backwards through the steps can happen right away. It can happen over a year or two. But it will happen. <laughs> So I just, I, I must share with you, I'm very grateful for the way God has disciplined me. I've been disciplined to the spiritual life, which is a question. Have we been disciplined to the spiritual life and nothing less than the spiritual life? Not disciplined to the wife or the husband or the boss or the employees or my sponsor, because they're fallible. They're human powers. But I've been disciplined to the spiritual life, which means I'm living along the lines of strict spiritual disciplines, which 10 and 11 talked about. My first six months, I didn't look anything like that. My first six months, I looked like a drunken sailor. I just haven't drunk, drank yet. And then I completely bottom out. So I've been grateful the way God has disciplined me because on my best day, I couldn't be as disciplined as I am now. And that's not to boast. That's just my truth. And I will share truth, God willing, over the next 12 weeks if he keeps me here, which means I might disturb folks. Tension is the surface of spiritual truth. So if we find ourselves getting a little uncomfortable with some of the things I'm saying or someone else says, it, or we're coming to an awakening or an awareness of a new place that we have to get past and we get tight, it's the tension. It's the last membrane before we break through. And the ego is going to fight that. The illness is going to fight that. My mind wants no part of anything uh, uh, to do with God. Tension is the surface of spiritual truth, but that's what I've been asked to do, is share my experience and hope, which means I'll share truth. So God has disciplined me in this way. And every Wednesday nights, I get on the phone with my sponsor for about an hour, at least every Wednesday night, and I share my life with him. Sometimes it's inventory, my nightly reviews, which God has disciplined me to do nightly reviews. I can count on one hand the times I've missed nightly review. It's what I do. I can count on one hand the times I've missed prayer and meditation. That's 25 years going into 26 now, on my best day, I couldn't even fathom doing something like that. But it's just chop wood and carry water, and I do it. So I share in return my sponsors. Sometimes we share scripture. Sometimes we just uh, share life circumstances, sponsorship questions I might have. God has made me very teachable and very much a student, always walking with a beginner's mind, because I have an expert's mind. I'm, no, I'm not teachable anymore. So I've been disciplined that way, and that's what I come to talk to you about what God has done for me. Nothing I've done, because me and my brokenness, there's a great quote from another book. I am weak flesh born into the slavery of sin. That's me. I'm tempted by everything when I'm untreated. Everything is an issue. Everything is a drama. I'm worried about other people's opinions of me. I have a chatter of a thousand voices in my head, and I do sinful or what, things or what we call in AA, we're acting out. I move away from this power, and I do things I really don't want to do. And I'm loaded with remorse and guilt the next day. That's me in the raw. But something changes to me and to us when we access this power called God, when we start to experience God, not just talk about God, not quote the big book, not quote scripture, not even come to an AA meeting and sound profound. It's what we're doing in the trenches, and let these 12 weeks reflect Everything I do the week before, last week, yesterday, this morning, six months ago. Let this talk be a reflection of where I am currently. I have some notes. I always bring some notes because I might be moved to share something. But my preparation is what I've been doing the past week, two weeks, three weeks, today, yesterday.
In fact, the notes you see me carrying, I don't sit down and go, what can I bring to that meeting that's going to make me sound like Moses? <laughs> These notes, while I'm in meditation and prayer, and I have, I have a stack this big. That's you put into a little book. These notes come from inspiration. They're not from me. I get an intuitive thought, something clicks. You know what I mean? You get something that clicks, and you know it's not coming from you. I learned a long time ago, put it on paper. It might be God speaking to us, because God does speak to us. It's called living along the lines of divine order, which transcends human order, which tells me I'm a drunk, I'm always going to be sick, I'm going to hang in there, and God only talks to the priests and the rabbis, he won't talk to a fallen down drunk. Nonsense. And so I trust that. It's my, my showing God that I believe he can speak to me. I believe he can speak to you. And sometimes I will be in a meeting and the speaker might sound, say something that resonates at a deep level with me. I'm jotting it down. I will go home if it's that powerful and meditate on it. Not rip somebody off and share it at a meeting and think it's mine. We do a lot of that in AA. Here's something profound. Run to home group and take ownership. All to get a speaking commitment. I hope they make me speak. You know? It's just something that's very private and intimate with me that I do. But the preparation is what I what I've been doing when I come here. So some of it might be true. Some of it, the truth. Some of it might disturb us, as it should. The spiritual journey, going through the archway that we're going to pass through, isn't always pleasant. It is uncomfortable. In fact, the walk with God, lots of times we think, God, talk to me to remove my distractions. If I have a relationship with God, it's going to be walking through a field of flowers and everything's going to be beautiful. Doves are going to fly around. Hops will be in the background. You know, that's not the way it goes. God will speak to us. God will move us. God will wake up the spirit. We will walk a very narrow road, a very disciplined road. And the distractions that are out there are still going to be there. The boss is going to do this. The co-workers are going to do this. The wife and husband are going to do this. It goes on and on. Life is problematic. And for me to think because I'm walking with God, all those things are going to settle down to the way I want them to. I'm in for a rude awakening. The relationship with God allows me, gives me a new GPS to, to navigate through that. I'm not immune to life's problems. And I've been made clear many, many years ago that I cannot live life on life's terms. And we sometimes hear that in some of our meetings by, by loving people. Hey, live life on life's terms. And my question is, how's that been working for you? Here's how I live life on life's terms. I wake up in the morning, I need a drink. I don't know why, I just need a drink. I need a drink to get in the shower, if I shower when I'm drinking. I need a drink before I eat, if I'm eating when I'm drinking. I need a drink to walk out the door. I need a drink to turn on the TV. I need a drink just to breathe. I can't walk into a crowd of people. I can't do anything. All I'm doing is dying. I can't live life on life's terms. But we get to live life on life's terms. And again, that's not living along the lines of human consciousness with what most of us are used to, even in AA, hanging in there. Don't leave till the miracle happens. It's happened. I'm sitting in an AA meeting. It's not where I'm supposed to be based on my track record, but I'm sitting with, in an AA meeting with our recovering folks. The miracles happen. God's tapped you on the head. Now what am I going to do about it? And so we go lots to, lots to lots of AA meetings, and we've got the 12 and 12, we've got big books, and we've got all kinds of stuff, and we don't do the steps. <coughs> so with an awakened spirit, things start to change, because even in my brokenness, and I don't know how long I might be broken until the day God takes me home, probably. Good way God keeps me right-sized. But something happens in that, 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 that brokenness, where the mind just doesn't have that buffer to say, this is bad, stay away. My mind says, not that bad, keep going. Something happens in the awakened spirit where I start to my perceptions and conceptions about everything change, about life, about people, about me, about God, about recovery, about my big book, about other religions, about other ideas on how to recover. Everything changes. And we truly get to come from the place we came from and will return to, and that is a place of stillness. All love, no opposite, and compassion. So here's a question. 
since today's Monday, since last Monday, how much dialogue have we had in the head in one week of fear, resentment, anxiety, projection, insecurity, hatred, trying to arrange the world to do what we want, and if they don't do this, damn it, I'm going to get them, and we gossip, and it goes on and on. In one week, how much of that have we had? And my next question is, if, if you say you did, why? Who's running my life? Who's running the show? And if I got lost in touch, got uh, lost the fact that you have a God too? So the neat thing about Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah, we come here to put a lid on the drinking and find a way not to drink anymore, but it's really about being us being driven to God, the God of our understanding, having a spiritual experience, which means it remedies the untreated alcoholism, because once I remove the symptom of this great problem, I got the symptoms running the show, my fear-based and insecure me, all my brokenness, and somehow with the touch of the master's hand, it's put back together. Will it be perfect? Probably not but enough to do great work. We can't do, I can't do ordinary things without God, but with God, we get to, and I get to accomplish the extraordinary things that civilians look at us and say, this is impossible. How are they running a company? They would fall down drunk a few years ago, but that's where we get to see the age of miracles too, because folks like us are not supposed to have a shot at life. We fail. Life on life's terms, I get an F on my report card. I will never be able to live life on life's terms. Life on God's terms is completely different. It's open. It's easy. It's open to everyone. It's not exclusive. It's challenging as all hell. But compared to chasing a drink and living on God's terms, one is hell and one is like kissing a newborn on the cheek. And in order for me to... to to want any of that, because everyone, a lot of people really need to be in AA and need to experience God, but it really comes down to who's going to fight for it, who wants it, because God's giving away all the time. But very few will go to it. Most of us are going to pass through this really wide gate, walk this really wide road, and waver all the time. And this path, for those of us who want it, know exactly what I'm talking about, the road gets really now in the gate. It's one person at a time. You can't just bring all your stuff in there. We need to be pruned. Right? A good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree doesn't. And God will continue to do the pruning. And every time God prunes me in 4 through 9, or with a sponsor telling me, hey, it's not this way, it's that way, or lovingly confronting me, that's pruning. And it doesn't feel good. The only reason why it doesn't feel good is because my ego is still breathing. And we become defensive. I become defensive. Yeah, but there's a great way to defend the ego. The ego deny what it knows and deny what it doesn't. And this ego, this 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 process is about getting the ego and grinding it into dust. Self must die. The mind's got to go. It is the predator. It is the troublemaker. Whether I'm sober one day or 25 years, it is the troublemaker, and it's always looking to take over. And when it does, I have current unmanageability, and I'm living all over page 52. The program that we get is not the fellowship. I come to a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not in a program. I almost got on a methadone program years ago. <laughs> I'm not in a program. I come to a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous, a sacred fellowship. In the fellowship, I find the program. It's called the 12 Steps, and we can get lit up by that. But have I been programmed by my program, or have I become enlightened by my program? Am I a warring uh, uh, individual with others who are in the book, not in the book, don't do the book the right way, you missed a couple of dots, you didn't cross every T, or am I living in a place of ease and comfort? Step one tells us we admit it with powers over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. And we say that at every meeting. When you read the 12 steps, you read how it works. We read it all the time. We admit it with piles over alcohol dash that our lives have become unmanageable. And then I sit down with a newcomer or even someone who's about been around AA a little bit. I say, what does that mean to you? Well, it means I can't drink. Is that it? You're already off on the wrong foot. Step one doesn't tell me I can't drink. 
Step one tells me, Peter Marinelli, the real alcohol on page 21, that I'm guaranteed to drink. I am drinking. Step one tells me I'm drinking, and there is no way around that. I have a death sentence in step one. I'm drinking till the day I die, and meetings don't treat that. I'm sorry. I go to a meeting, it's a band-aid on an open wound, obviously. There's camaraderie, there's fellowship, we lean on each other. But at some point, the meeting's over and I have to go home to my apartment. And maybe it's empty, or I have to go to work tomorrow with people I'm uncomfortable with. Or I have some, some trauma or drama out there, some, some challenges out there that I can't get through and I need a drink. At some point when I'm alone, my mind will say, we need one more drink, and we keep relapsing. But God could, and what if he was sought? We admit it, we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become un unmanageable. Powerless over alcohol, which means I don't have power. In chapter two, Agnostics, it tells me on page 44, 45, lack of power was my dilemma. Lack of power is my problem. And I will share with you the most, the most powerful words in the entire big book for me is lack of power. Peter, that's your problem. It was then and it is now. We flip it around, which I always like to do, take statements, turn them into questions, flip, flip the statement around. What's the opposite? With power, no dilemma. Oh, so where do I get this power? I'm powerless over alcohol that my life had become unmanageable. No power. Which means I don't have choice and control. And I haven't even picked up a drink yet. This is all coming from the mind. Something tells me to drink, not the body. If I'm sober, I get out of a treatment center, or maybe I have 90 days or six months or five or ten years, and I'm sober. Who tells me to pick up a drink? My mind. And I can't stop that. And the big book talks about, though, uses the word suddenly in Jim's story. When suddenly shows up, we're in a lot of trouble. This little thing that goes off and says, drink looks good, and I go. And I can't outthink it. I can't play the tape to the end. I can't remember where I come from. It'll work for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, but at some point, bang. I blow up. And I say, how did this happen? That wasn't the plan, because my mind is God. And it owns me. It makes a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And for most of us, me for the longest time, my mind was my master. Whatever it said, I did. And going into the bad neighborhoods, going into back alleys, trying to find something to make me okay, when I know it's a bad move, but I cannot fight it off, we can do that in recovery too. So no power, choice, control in the mind before I pick up a drink. And then what happens when I pick up a drink? We have something called the phenomenon of craving, the allergy. That more means more. I'm in a treatment center business, and I, and I love when they do this, when the, when the, the counselors say, what's your drug of choice? <laughs> I have to do this from puking. <laughs> drug of choice. You know what my drug of choice is? More. That's my drug of choice. <laughs> Now I know what they mean. This guy prefers heroin. This guy prefers crack. This one likes to. I get what they're going, uh, but we need to be real careful of language. My drug of choice is more. Just give me more, and that's because of the craving. If I started drinking tonight, I'm drinking until you pull me out of a dumpster tomorrow morning. I drink. I just keep drinking. That's not the plan. I want to go out on a date, have a little drink, a little before dinner drink, just to kind of warm it up and be nice, because I'm really scared to death and I need something to talk to this woman. <laughs> Even though I'm playing Joe Casanova and everything's cool. All right. And so I have a, I'll tell you a true story. <laughs> I'm about 18, 19 years old, and I, I'm drinking, and I'm a wannabe musician, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm like Keith Moon of the Who, and, you know, and um, there was this woman in, in the neighborhood back in, back in uh, 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 New York, and um, I was like, I used to look at this woman and go, oh my God, I gotta get a date with this girl, I gotta take her out. And every guy in the neighborhood was trying to like posh her to get a date, and I asked and she said yes. And it was going to a block party for me. Pete got a date with her, oh my God, way to go. And the guys are patting me on the back and way to go. And they're giving me instructions what to do on a date, which I know. Um, so I finally take this young lady out. And I asked where to take her. I asked a couple of guys. He says, go to this place in New York. It's a really nice restaurant. There I am. I'm dressed up for me at the time. I'm dressed. And she's dressed. And we're sitting down. And I order, I never forget this, a Jack Daniels. I have a Jack Daniels. A little Coke on the side. Not powder, Coca-Cola. 
<laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and like a lady, she had the little, I don't get this, the little glass of white wine that they nurture through the night. They sip and a little too much. <laughs> and I have the Jack Daniels. It goes down and the engine got turned on. Right. Now I'm feeling nice. Now I'm feeling like Joe Casanova. Right? Everything's good. And um, I backed that up. I had another one. And into the second one, I was in. And I never forget, how do I get rid of her tonight? I have a whole dinner with her. And she's going to probably want to go out after dinner. And I know what I want to do. Get a pint out of the liquor store and go to the projects. And I got to caught this lady. Bad move. What a stupid mistake. That's how quick everything changes. Because my body says we got to drink, and I'm not about socializing. It's about drinking to feed this monster that never gets its thirst quenched. It's alcoholism. Now, I had plans that night to be a gentleman and to court this woman. The liquor went in and says, get rid of her, go to the liquor store, and let's go to the projects. <laughs> well, I dropped her off early, and she never spoke to me again. <laughs> and that's just typical of a lot of things I, I attempted to do, started out doing on my best behavior until you put liquor in. Bill tells a great story. He was in New Jersey. He put the plug in the jug for a while, and he was trying to kick off this business deal, and they had something called Jersey Light and Apple Jack, something like this, and they passed it around. Bill's like, no, no, no. I'm on the wagon. And he says, wait, what was that? I never tried that before. <laughs> and that was the end of Bill's career again. And that's what happens to us, the phenomenon called craving. And once I pick up a drink, the cravings intensify, never satisfy. That's unmanageability. The other piece of unmanageability in the second half of the first step is this. We can, you can spot my, in 1988, I was homeless. I hadn't changed my clothes or bathed in I don't know how long, and I couldn't remember the last time I had a full meal. My diet, I'm not using this to, to be funny, was I'd steal a bag of Twinkies out of a bodega and wash it down whatever I was drinking. That was it. I would walk around, before I got thrown out of this apartment, uh, uh, in the cabinet were two things. An old box of Domino sugar cubes and an old box, box of spaghetti pasta. And I used to take some of the pasta, break it in half, and a handful of sugar cubes, and I eat the hot pasta and eat sugar cubes. That was dinner, breakfast, and lunch, if I ate. That's what it came down to, because the money I hustled on the street, the five or ten bucks, was liquid to go in. I can't take money away from my Mr. Boston Blackberry brandy. I need drinking money, and I know I'm going to need to drink. So forget about eating. And I found once I got a good load on, I wasn't too hungry anymore. My thing was drinking. I'd go down <clears throat> in a hallway, pass out, and come to and keep it going again. Hmm? So anyone can see my life was unmanageable. I had no family. I was filthy bum, living on the streets. and doing all these nasty things for the price of a drink. That's unmanageability. That's only one little piece of it. At the core, the essence of unmanageability in step one is not knowing what the day is going to look like when we go drink and we can't stop. The goose hung high, Bill Wilson says in his story. Fred said there wasn't a cloud on the horizon. It was the end of a perfect day. We won't drink. I won't drink because things are bad. I'll, 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 I'll get drunk because I have a date with a wonderful woman that I've been trying to get a date with for a long time. Good. Got up. Let's get drunk. Come into a, wind, a, a, a financial windfall. Good. I got money. Let's go get drunk. It's a beautiful day down at the beach. Let's jack it up a little bit. Let's get drunk. Or it's the tales of woe and oh my God. We drink. I drink. Sun comes up. Sun comes down. I'm drinking. And very often the plan wasn't to get drunk. I wake up. Okay, that's it. I'm done after I have one drink. I mean, I don't know if you can identify with this. I can't tell you the amount of times I had a plan of action. I know I'm in trouble. So in 1986, 87, and I would do this. Okay, I'm going to go to the liquor store. I'm going to get a bunch of liquor. I'm going to buy a, a quart or whatever it is, and I'm going to check myself into a, ho a hotel room. I'm going to either A, get one good drunk on, and then go to a hospital for help, or I'm going to wean myself off. 
but I gotta be away from everyone. So what happens? I go to the liquor store. I get whatever I get at a liquor store, Mr. Boston, Blackberry, Brandy. Now it's in my car and I'm driving. And I start, I'm not going to a hotel room to wean off. I'm drinking. All bets are off. I gotta finish this monster and keep going. My plans many times out of treatment, nine weeks one time after my fifth treatment center. I've been away seven times after my fifth treatment center. I lasted two days of sobriety. On the way in, I said, okay, I'm going to do something about this. I had a powerful desire going into treatment center number five. I had a powerful desire. I'm done. I'm done with the nightmare. I'm done with the powder. The powder was killing me. The detox were horrific. The pills were killing me. The liquid was killing me. No more. Two days later, my mind says, we're not doing powder, but liquor. <laughs> and I went to the liquor store. I never forget this. Discharged on Saturday, drunk on Monday. I walked into the liquor store, uh, downtown Brooklyn, on a street called Henry Street. And I went in there, give me pint of Mr. Boston, like, hurry up. My body didn't need liquor. I was away for nine weeks in treatment. I was past, way past post-acute withdrawal. The body didn't need the substance. My body was fine. My mind said we need it, and my body felt like I need a drink. That's how powerful this thing is. And I, I was fidgety. Hurry up. Give me, I, boom, right down. Oh, thank you, God. That's alcoholism. I don't, have a, I don't identify with having a drink just to kind of be around company and hang out. A little after dinner drink. You ever see the after dinner drink? The small one in the stone. That's alcohol abuse, by the way. <laughs> 43 pages in my book will talk about the first step. Because Bill and the founding members and God knew I was going to show up in 1988, and I'm stubborn. I got cement in here. In five or ten pages in a little chapter, a little pamphlet, it's not going to get this guy. we got to nail him over and over and over and over and over again with considerations and warnings about what he's going to be up against. 43 pages plus doctor's opinion. All to do with unmanageability. My lack of power, choice, and control. So I'm constantly getting bookended when I'm drinking or before I drink from the mind and the body. And that's two pieces of this deadly disease. Uh, uh, Chuck Chamberlain used to say we have a, a terminal illness called alcohols and wants me dead will settle for me drunk. And the third piece is the, the, the lack of a relationship with the higher power. God. We might know about God. We might go to our religious community. We might know scripture. We might, might know the big book. But we're talking about a personal relationship with the higher power, which means I have to pay attention. I have to give attention to relationship. I love the analogy where if we're best friends and you're sharing with me very uh, intimate things and you're my buddy and I'm yours and you, I got to talk to you. You're talking about maybe marital problems or financial problems and they're important to you. As a friend, I say, okay, hold it. Close the door. Watch going on and we have time together but could you imagine if I did that while I'm texting well let me take this call Joe one minute what were you saying and I keep doing this I don't have a relationship with you with God everything's got to stop I need to practice fidelity to my God not infidelity anything I put before God I'm cheating on God and it's the only thing that's going to give me another day above ground sucking air and sober and a whole lot more but what's my relationship with God look like? And that's what AA is about when we study our, our history. And we go back to the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, they read right out of Scripture. They, they didn't apologize for God. In fact, they very much resembled a Christian movement. And if that wasn't your deal, then good luck to you. This is the last show. This is it. You either lock in or keep drinking. And people didn't use that as an issue. Too much God, it's a little Christian, it's a little of that. We're closed with this large prayer. This is it. Because they came at it with a sense of urgency. The same way if we were drowning in the ocean and we're going down for the third time and we're coming to terms with this is it, and a little canoe comes by, am I going to say, no, I was waiting for one of the yachts out of Boca. <laughs> you know. You're, you're hooking on to a canoe. And you don't care if the, the canoe driver, I don't know who you call 
captain of the canoe. I mean, <laughs> you can tell I'm from Brooklyn. Right? <laughs> it's black, white, Muslim, Jew, Catholic, atheist. You don't care. I'm drowning. I'm dying. Please help me. All you want is the hand to pull you up. And, then what happens to an alcoholic, right? We get on the canoe or the boat, we catch our breath, we're back to normal, and you start telling the guy, you know, I think you should paint this a different color. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're going the wrong way. <laughs> Two things I just want to share with you uh, about... Uh, Untreated alcoholism and another point. On page 52, something called the bedevilments. And bedevilments, I had to look it up. My sponsor, when he first started with me, says, get a dictionary besides a big book because there's words in here that you're not going to know. Thank God he told me to do that. Bedevilments was one of them. <clears throat> bedevilments is something that torments, frustrates, or harasses me. So if we live next door to someone who torment, torments, frustrates, and harasses us, We'd either have a confrontation with them, or we call the police. If someone was, we have orders of uh, laws of protection to do that. You know, we have all these things in place so people cannot torment, frustrate, and harass us. Except if it's our own mind, and we keep inviting these troublemakers in. So here's what untreated alcoholism looks like, which means I'm sober, I'm not drinking, but I still am behaving and feeling, interpreting the world like an active drunk, a fear-based, insecure person, or perhaps civilians out there. It says, we were having trouble with personal relationships. Take a statement, flip it into a question. Am I having trouble in personal relationships? I'm not talking about the occasional fight with the spouse, or maybe a union, kids get into it, they get annoyed one day. Trouble in personal relationships. I'm, in, I'm at war with everyone. I'm constantly having conflict, even when no one's around. When I'm sitting on my couch alone having my first cup of coffee in the morning and I got it going on. I didn't get to work that <laughs> Right? Or my sponsor does this. He, he, we always do this on awakening, immediately on awakening, laying in bed. Thank you, God, for this day. Keep me clean and sober before we hit the mat. Meditate and pray. My sponsor does this. God, please direct my thinking to... Uh, uh, because in about a minute, an alcoholic is going to take over my life, and that's going to be bad. Because that's what we do. As soon as we wake up, open up the eyes, come to the voice. It's, only, it's a mid-conversation. <laughs> and it's going at you. All day long. And they invite other voices in. <laughs> and then we're entertaining a committee. And what my head looks like is this. Maybe a hundred people here tonight will say. If every one of you started to talk to me at once, you holler at me, you give me advice, you tell me I'm no good, you tell me they're all no good, you tell me I'm a failure, you tell me I should be rich, and then the rest of you guys start asking me questions all at once. And I try to pay attention to every one. Yes, I will. No, I won't. Maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe I don't. We go back and forth. That's why when we ask, when you ask an alcoholic, how are you doing, we go, I'm tired. I've been speaking to three million people all day long. Right? As soon as I wake up and I walk into a meeting, see if we identify with this, we walk into a meeting and um, we want to show everyone we're spiritual so the voice goes down to about here. How are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm Moses. <laughs> But in your head, you're going, I can't stand this one. I hope my shoes go out. I mean, she needs a sponsor. I don't like this guy. He's speaking. I can't stand him. I don't even like this group. What am I doing? I should be up. <laughs> How you doing? I'm fine. Everything is good. Everything is beautiful. <laughs> On the way to the meeting, you're late, and somebody in front of you is going slow, and you are ripping them apart, <laughs> cutting people off, blowing red lights. You walk into me. How you doing? Fine. <laughs> So we're having trouble with personal relationships. Here's another easy one. <clears throat> you go to a meeting, and the speaker doesn't share what you think they should be sharing. <laughs> and you sit there for an hour, and you hope they have a heart attack. <laughs> Why did I come here? Like you guys are doing tonight, probably. Why did I come here? 
they misquoted the big book. And it and troubled personal relationships. And this is this is not an occasional thing. This is going on all the time. It says, um, um, we couldn't control our emotional nature. Fly off the handle for no reason. I'm really grouchy in the morning. Every morning I'm grouchy until I have a pot of coffee in me. Then I'm kind of ease off a little bit. But if one thing goes south, I'm crazy. Or I'm just joyful for no reason. I'm giddy, and then I bottom out, and I'm up and down. I wake up in the morning, what's it going to be today? And maybe I break a shoelace, and I go off the deep end. Or I'm dependent upon other people to make me feel good. If my boss walks by me and just waves, oh, no. My my boss walks by me and says, great job, I'm happy. And I ride this roller coaster, right? It, it talks about uh, we were prey to misery and depression, a prey. I'm like this little field mouse, and the eagle comes down and screws me up whenever he wants. I can't get away from it. I'm a prey to misery and depression. And the only way I, I lose misery and depression is based on what you do for me. So it immediately throws me into assigning people roles, assigning me a role, assigning God a role. And I become the director, and it never works. This is all I'm treated of. This is all coming from my lack of communication with God, my lack of a relationship, which means I'm into worldly affairs. I'm into worldliness rather than godliness. Be in the world, not of the world. And for someone like me, when that stuff starts, I'm going to look for relief somewhere. And if I'm sober, I might look for relief in food. I might look for relief in money and working a lot. I might look for relief in sex. I might look for relief in a drink. And I don't know which is going to come first, but it's going to come. I couldn't make a living. You know, I'm out of work. I don't even care about working. I'm working and I'm miserable at work. I hate my job and they hate me. If you poll people, they say, this guy's not a nice guy. He's all about himself. How am I doing? Am I working for the glory of God? Or am I working for my own ego? Look at me. You know, if a project is done well, I take all the credit and say, thank God for my staff. It's all about me. Um, the other one is we're a feeling of uselessness, full of fear. We're unhappy and can't seem to be of real, real help to other people. Any of those things, cooking a lot, do I experience a lot of that? My first six months in Alcoholics Anonymous, I mean, that, that's where I was at. I wasn't drinking, but I was full of that stuff. It was all about me. And any time I have fell asleep in Alcoholics Anonymous, spiritually asleep, that stuff comes roaring back. Because the longer I'm sober, the progression goes into like a crescendo. It gets louder. And as soon as it snaps down on me, I'm in a lot of trouble. I get sick quick. For me, it's never been a gradual decline. It's pillow up. On page 34, if you have a big book, it says, <clears throat> we are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Well, I have a desire to stop, but just having a desire won't keep me stopped. Whether I can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which I have already lost the power to choose whether I will drink or not. So if I'm beyond power, choice, control, I need a spiritual way of living. So if I, if I come to terms in step one with my lack of power, choice, and control, that my life has become unmanageable, there's two parts to the first step. Now, one of the things I can get in trouble with is this. The second half of the first step, it says we admit our life, uh, 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 we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. So I'm sober a little while, which means I'm probably going to be employable. So I get a little job, or I get a really career job, and I start to make some money, and I can buy nice clothes, and I can get a car, and I can get a nice little relationship, and I have a nice place to live, and people like me in AA because I'm attending meetings, and I have some money in my pocket. In fact, I'll even buy some of us dinner, and everything from the external view looks pretty good, and I, my thing is, well, life is pretty manageable now. I'm working every day. I go to meetings. I got some money in my pocket. I even have a little checking account. I just bought a new car. I have expensive cigars. I have a really nice woman with me. Look, life is manageable again. Wrong. The only way my life becomes manageable, regardless of what's going on out there, is based on my relationship with God. For me, this whole thing hinges on my relationship with my God, with my Creator. Everything hinges on that. 
And if I have new clothes or a nice car or I don't, it really doesn't have much push on me because I'm right with my God. And everything seems to fall into place. I can wear the world, as the carpenter said, like a loose garment. I'm not wrapped up in worldly affairs, in worldliness. This is all unmanageability for step one. And I need to be clear. If I knew it's about getting a drink or, or the other stuff off my back, it's killing me. It's pretty obvious. The fire's hot, and i got to get away from it. And so I come to A, and I start going through the steps, and I'm not drinking, I'm not drugging, and things start to get a little bit better. But what about those of us, especially when it comes to bedevilments, who've been in this a little while, a couple years, five years, double digits, and we're sponsoring people, but I'm not growing in understanding and effectiveness. I'm not really working with 10 and 11. And my ego's gotten so big that anything to do with the book or the steps, I shut down. And I won't tell anyone how much pain I'm in. Because unmanageability in the second half of the first step applies to those of us who have even been around here a while. On page 18, there's a great piece of information. And it says, if I can get to it, it says, um, if a person has cancer, all are sorry for no one is angry or hurt, but not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it there goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. Our illness, we do, engulf all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends, and employers, warped lives of blameless children. Got sober. Am I doing that? How am I doing? All right. My sponsor, Mark, would always always ask a question to groups and to us, his sponsees. How are you doing? And he didn't mean like I'm working, everything's good. Spiritually, how are we doing today? Where am I currently? Forget yesterday. I can't stay full on what I ate yesterday. I have to eat today. I have to get soul food today. I have to seek my God the desperation of a drowning man every day, throughout the day. Got to feed the soul. So I come to meetings, keeps me... Uh, attached to you, around you guys, and in there I get a program which brings me to God, and my soul gets full, and I give the whole thing away in service. No more wavering. It's the most important relationship in my life that keeps me away from relapsing again. Because after the relapse, I get drunk. My relapse looks like page 52. I'm not drinking yet, but I'm relapsing. I've gone away. And then I get drunk and the relapse is over and now I'm drunk. And I don't know what's going to stop me, maybe other than the divine intervention. And the neat thing about this is once I come to terms at a gut level, at a cellular level, with my lack of power and the need for power, and I'm, I get the gift of desperation, I will reach out to others for help. And one of the questions my sponsor asked me upon sponsorship, the beginning of that relationship, was, are you willing to go to any lengths to get recovered from alcoholism? And I said, yes. But the hook was, any lengths was none of my business. I ask guys all this, this question all the time, you want to go to any lengths? And there's a pause. That means no. Because <laughs> they're trying to figure out, what does he mean? What's any lengths look like? I would go to any lengths. Many of us in this room would go to any lengths, many, any lengths, to get drunk and high. Go into the worst neighborhoods. The cops where they wouldn't care. We would risk everything for the price of a drink. And I come into AA, and they say, Peter, you want to go to any lengths? And I debate that. Our book talks about the inability to see the truth. Can't differentiate the true from the false. This is what we're talking about. Every time I go out, every time I get away from God, my life blows up. So are you willing to go to England to get God? Let me think about it. Let me make 90 meetings in 90 days. So it's a complete surrender for me as it is now, and I will tell you currently, it's been this way for years, but to talk about where I'm currently, I get on my knees in the morning and surrender. I ask God to keep me clean and sober because I have a history of powdered stuff. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. Let me just get that out of the way. I did a ton of drugs, but I'm not an addict. Around 1986, I walked away from powder because I couldn't take... Purely because I couldn't take the detoxes off of off of snack anymore. I couldn't do it. My arms were, were a mess. They were disgusting to look at. I couldn't I couldn't deal with that. But booze, 
was my God. I could not. I could not get away from alcohol. That was my deal. So I did a ton of drugs, but I'm not an addict. I am certainly an alcoholic. And that's what I surrendered to God to. But I always ask him, keep me clean and sober. Because I do know one thing. Even though I'm not an addict, if I smoke a joint, I'm powerless over where it's going to take me to, which means I'm going to the liquor store and buy booze. And some of us, I ran to a lot of the young kids in my business, and they're purely heroin addicts. And they say, I never drink. And I ask them, did you have a problem with drinking? And they say, no. But if they pick up a drink and they start to get a mood of mono three substance in them, they're going to go into the projects and cop dope. So I make sure I go to my God. Now, my God knows this, but I still, it's an act of humility, an act of surrender. Father, please keep me clean and sober for the day. Because on my own power, I have no power, choice, and control. So I surrender to God. And every day has been a surrender for me. Every day. And where I am currently is not only in the morning with prayer meditation to keep this thing arrested because I'm not cured, even though I'm recovered. And I'm only recovered because of God and God's grace. That's the only reason I'm here speaking for the next 12 weeks. If God doesn't want me here, you'll have another speaker. And it's only because I'm clear on that. God got me to this podium and God gives me what I share, not me. So I surrender to this power because I like doing it. I like the effect produced by God. I love the effect produced by booze. It stopped working. I like the effect produced by God. So it's a surrender in the morning and some prayer and meditation. I haven't been reading anything in the morning until recently. Marion turned me off to some neat stuff. And so I started reading some things in the morning again. But I'm not a slave to it. The only thing I'm a slave to is my God. And that's a good thing. That's a, I don't mean that in a slave where somebody's cracking a whip. Got to be like a child around God. Want to be an adult around God. He's the adult, I'm the child. He's the father, I'm the child. I want to be giddy around God. I want to be teacher. I want to be in awe of a green tree. I want to be in awe of the sun coming up. I don't want to have contempt. So I surrender to God in the afternoon. I do the same thing. I do a little prayer meditation in the afternoon. Every afternoon, I disappear. I go hide out in my car somewhere at work. And at night, I do the same thing. A little prayer, a little meditation, some nightly review. Pretty easy, like kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to what I can do to my life what I can do to other people. I'm not that powerful. I'm not a strong guy. I'm not a big guy. I'm not, I'm not you know, a fighter. But my addiction is like Muhammad Ali. It does a lot of damage. And I'm just not willing to pay that price. So it's a surrender. And just to review, 43 pages talk about step one, about what I'm going to do. And that's I'm going to drink. Meetings don't treat my alcoholism. Step one tells me I'm going to drink. I'm doomed to drink. I will die as a drunk. And I'm doomed to relapse. I'm doomed to pick up a drink and go on another drunk. Unless I get to step two, which tells me it's a pointer to the solution. Which means if I want to go to that solution, I make a decision in three, say, yeah, I want to go there. I want to go to this God and let him do for me what I can't do for myself. Because based on my experience, I haven't been doing such a good job. In fact, I've been doing terrible Drunk or sober, I'm an alcoholic and cannot manage my own life. That God could and we would if he was sought. I'm powerful over alcohol, my life's unmanageable. Step three, I make a decision to go to this power. And four through nine, somewhere in there, I will experience this power. That's a guarantee out of my book. Because by the time I get down to ten, and in the process of cleaning up amends, my book says I come through the world of the spirit. I've had a transformation. Then it tells me to do, grow with it and go give it all away. Go get God's kids who are sick. Because I'm not here for me anymore. As servants of God, I'm not here to be served, but to serve. That's what we do. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It's called sponsorship, thank God. And I'm glad my teachers didn't say, ah, we come from somebody else. I had a bad day today. Good day, bad day. There's so many to do. Go get them. Hook them. Bring them in. And if he wants desperately what we got to offer, this will be easy work. And if they still have reservation or lurking notion, maybe they're not done. They wasted no time. In a vision for you, Bill and Bob talk about meeting Bill Dotson and what they did to this guy. Best 12-step call ever. In Bill Dotson's story, alcoholic number three, he tells his angle on it, and he hears Bill and Bob saying, you think this guy's worth saving to each other. He heard Bill and Bob. Bill and Bob now. This isn't some guy in AA. Bill and Bob, our co-founders, leaned over to each other about Bill Dotson, a guy in the bed saying, you think he's worth saving? 
You think he's desperate enough, because if he isn't, go drink. We'll get somebody else. There was a great sense of urgency. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that's the right way. I'm not saying it's the wrong way. It's what they did. And they were armed with the facts about the body, mind, and spirit. The more hopeless we feel, the better, my book tells me. And if we disturb someone on the question of alcoholism, it's all to the good, my big book tells me. So the newcomers are coming, we've got to pick them up. We've got to put them together. We never, sh- we never shoot the wounded. You talk, they only know what they know. But those of us who have been around here a while, what am I doing to put them back together? I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And I had a responsibility to end at 8.30. That's all I got. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Peter. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm about to get the State of the Union to drop. <laughs> If you'll be alive and sober, I think, at this meeting. I'm not sure. Um, thanks for having me, and um, thank you all for being here. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. I'm a recovered alcoholic, and uh, I say recovered because I am. Anything less than that would be false and humble. And uh, what I uh, come here to share with you is what God has given me, uh, not what I intend on giving you. And um, as long as I'm growing and understanding and affecting this and living in, in godliness rather than worldliness, uh, there's a good chance that might happen. And I've said this from a million podiums. I hope I never show up for any of these talks. Uh, but let this talk be a reflection of the work I've been doing as of an hour ago, a week ago, a month ago, etc. cetera. Uh, came into Alcoholics Anonymous after seven treatment centers in June of 1988. And I was certainly not the uh, poster child for recovery, nor do I claim to be one now. Uh, but what's before you tonight is a lot different than what showed up in 1988, where um, even though I was praying to God, um, I was really out of desperation, no love for God, and not much trust for God. It was just, it was the only thing left, and that's what my teachers were telling me, that's what the elders were telling me to do, so I did as they did, and I didn't ask questions. One of the things I've been blessed with uh, over the last 25 years or so has been uh, God disciplining me to the spiritual life. Whether it meant calling my sponsor on time and keeping my appointments before anything, and getting on my knees in the morning and praying to three times a day as I do now, and showing up for meetings and keeping commitments and doing all the things I need to do uh, and not asking questions. I questioned it inside. Why are they asking me to do all of these things? But I never gave a yeah but to any of my teachers. And quite frankly, nothing came before recovery. And what as that looks like now is a very disciplined life. Um, it doesn't mean I don't kind of kick back and have some fun. I have a blast with my life, but it's a very disciplined life. And uh, in another book, it talks about how many will walk the wide road and pass through a wide gate and will not experience this power. And those of us who are called uh, will be walking a very narrow road and passing through a narrow gate. And that's just the way it is. I was watching a, a film the other day, a movie on TV, um, and there's this uh, young fellow who's lost his direction, he's a wannabe lawyer, and he's speaking to his mentor, who is a very, very successful judge and has a whole career of law, and he's expressing to this uh, young fellow what it's like doing what he's doing. He has great passion for the law and just gobbled it up in college. And he says when he was growing up, um, he was to be a rabbi and thought he wanted to be a rabbi, and his family was thrilled that he was going to be a rabbi. And there was all this excitement on this, uh, what I would call a protege, and he's sharing with that, and he says, by the time I was 14, I didn't want to be a rabbi because I didn't believe in God. He says, but something happened to me with the law, and he said, I just dove into the law, and I'm very successful. And this young fellow asked him, he says, if you had to do it over again, would you make the same choice? And the reply was profound. He says, what choice? And the thing about this path, if you're called, you're called. I don't mean just staying sober. I'm talking about walking a straight, a strict, uh, working with a set of strict spiritual disciplines, walking a narrow road, doing some of the things that some of us do, the many, any lengths we go through, and walking through dark night of the soul, and kind of feeling like we're losing our way in prayer, losing our way in meditation, losing our way in recovery, because we can't see what's up ahead. And we completely relinquish all control. 
And our prayer is not to get me all charged up and get my batteries charged up to get back into life so I can navigate through life. It's about getting right with God and let God move me through and relinquish the, you know, the shackles around my wrist where life tells me what to do. Many of us walk through life based on what life tells us to do, what people tell us to do. If I drive this car, if I drink this drink, if I live in this house, I'm a made guy. Everything's great. If I have this kind of body, if I have that much hair, if I wear this kind of suit, I mean, it goes on and on and on. That's just bondage. And the thing about prayer is getting me right in here to let go of all of that, to have no attachments to any of that. And I'm really retreating from all of that back to God, which allows me to go out and live the life God has given me. And when we're called, we're called. <clears throat> we get callings in Alcoholics Anonymous. In 1988, I wasn't looking for God, and I wasn't looking for the truth. God and the truth found me. The truth will always find us. It'll find you on, on, in Alcoholics Anonymous when you're sober 10, 15, 20, 30 years. The truth will find you. And when it does, it's not always pleasant. <coughs> but there's a tremendous amount of freedom if I lock into it, and I usually do that when there's nowhere else to lock into, where everything gets removed. And that is part of coming to terms at a gut level through desperation of my first step. Where there's nothing else to lock into but this God, and I don't care where I go, I don't take where it takes me, I'm going. And even though it's very uncertain at the beginning, early recovery is very difficult. I don't care who our sponsor is, it's difficult, it's a challenge, because I'm battling the old voices, I'm battling the old belief systems. And all of those things want to take me back to a drink or a drug, or bounce in and out of relationships, or thinking money is my God, or she's my God, or the car's my God. Many of us don't want to let go of that. We want God, but we want our stuff too. And what I've come to terms with in the, in the insanity of that, if I, I kind of let go in step one, where I'm done with everything. I do not want to run the show. And it comes in a place of complete desperation that we get there when we really bottom out at a gut level, an emotional level. Because we can take beatings. I took beatings. I could take, took getting locked up. I took bouncing out of relationships, and she chased me away, and he chased me. Even the family telling me not to come home. I bounce back from all that stuff. But when it gets us here, that's why a book says, when we can see to our innermost self, that's a spiritual event. It's way down in here where I'm done. And we know when we're done, all we have to do is look in the mirror and ask ourselves, am I done? The guy looking back is going to tell you, no, you're not. Or yes, you are. And we look at, you know, some of the behavior. I looked at some of the behavior I was doing, even in early recovery, even in sobriety, doing the same thing over, expecting different results. My mind says, well, I'm not drinking. And what I've come to terms with is this image that we try to portray. Many of us on the way in, even if we're coming out of a dumpster, want to show we look good. Or we have to show we're the worst dope fiend, worst drunk ever to hit Alcoholics Anonymous. There's an image attached to that. And really the sense of who we are does not come from any of that. It doesn't come from mind, but thought it comes from spirit, which means I can't experience God. And some of the, my demons in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, in sobriety have been the image. But it wasn't the image as to what you think of me. I need to look good in front of you. I need to have a pocket full of money to get your acceptance or a nice car. That was long gone. And I've been brought to a place where I'm not really caring about what people think of me. I think that's why I get free when I do this stuff. I'm not doing a talk to get approval. It's just the way God moves me. There's another piece of image. Is that I need to, do I get dressed? Do we get dressed because we like getting dressed? Or are we getting dressed to shut down the voice in the head that says, look at you, you're still a loser, you're not dressed. Am I, am I cleaning my car? Am I saving money? Am I buying that house? Because that's what I like to do. I want to take care of my family. I want to earn money so we can have a life together. Or am I doing it because the voice in the head says, you didn't buy a house yet, you didn't make this much money yet, look at you, you're a loser. So I'm trying to shut down this voice in the head that presents to me an image that you don't know about. And I keep chasing, I keep chasing, I keep trying to get over that obstacle, but the voice never goes away until we bottom out and we say, I'm done with this. And it's another surrender to God. Because if I'm listening to, if I'm worried about your voice telling me I'm okay, or the voice in my head telling me okay, either way, I'm shackled to self and it's death before the physical death. 
And many of us live in Alcoholics Anonymous for years like this, whether attached to what you think of me, pride and ego, or what my mind tells me about me. That's just not a free way to live. How free do we want to be? If we're feeling freedom tonight, do we want to get freer? Am I completely free from the demons in the head, the voices in the head, and the attachments to what people think of me? Imagine going through life worried about what everyone in this room says about me. I go home now. I know some of you wish I did, but I'm not. I go home now. And when we hit the pillow at night, that rustling, tossing and turning and the voices in the head, no one's around. No one is around. In fact, if I'm, if I'm with, with the partner and they're sleeping, they're not even talking to me, so I'm, I can't even hear them. But who's talking to me? The voice in the head or voices in the head. We have a lot of them. Mine have been brutal, absolutely brutal, without mercy. How long was I going to keep listening to this guy? And yet I and us would keep listening and doing the same thing over, expecting different results, buying bigger things, uh, more expensive things, trying to show up, trying to do all the stuff, not for you, but for what this voice in the head says. That's complete powerless over that as well. And I need to hit my knees and throw myself at the mercy of God and say, remove this from me. I am not a good agent for you. And here comes the calling. Am I really believing? Or do I have a calling to this power to serve others? Because if I am, I can't have anything stay in the way. Nothing. Where I live, who I date, who I'm married to, what I drive, what kind of money I have, none of it's any of my business. That's a narrow gate and a narrow road. Many of us are going to balk. The end result of that is a complete lie, a life of complete freedom. Freedom from self. Our book in the third step says, uh, relieve me of the bondage of self. This is what we're talking about. Sure, the obvious things when we come in here, we're wrapped up into all sorts of delusional thinking, illusional thoughts. We're wrapped up. We got, we're handcuffed when we come in here. But when we're sober a little while, who am I in bondage to? No one but me and my belief system, my thoughts and ideas about everything. How this room should be set up. As soon as I walked in here, I thought, well, the podium's crooked. i got to tell James. It should be just a little bit this way. And that whole row is facing there. I was, you know. But it's none of my business. I'm here to speak, not to set up the room. But that's how quick stuff starts. Start. I can't believe you set it up this way. Doesn't even know who I am. I can't believe <laughs> Then the voice tells me, look at you. You're speaking at this place, the rows are crooked. Oh, my God. Get it? That's the same voice that says, you know what? You're a drunk. Why don't you just go have a drink? And who are you kidding? Mr. Step Worker, Mr. Big Book, Mr. Praying, who are you kidding? You're a drunk. Let's just get it going. And we buy into that. And there's nothing I can do on my best day to prevent that. My best intention is the most powerful desire to stay away from a voice like that. I have no power over it. When it shows up, it shows up. The, the big book talks about uh, a Jim the automobile salesman sitting in, a, in, in a, a restaurant, and he says, suddenly shows up. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind if he was to put whiskey with milk. When suddenly shows up, that's it. We're handcuffed. So I could be sitting in a, in a meeting listening to, you know, anyone, and I'm feeling free, and then suddenly the voice says, what are you doing here, man? This is like losers, bro. What are you doing here? You should be out doing something. And we buy right into it, and we check out of the meeting. I don't want to be a slave to my mind anymore. I will experience less damage from my most hated enemy compared to what my mind has for me. And what gets in the way is pride, what you think of me, idolatry, what I'm going to worship, my money, my relationship, my car, my house, all the external stuff. My image, what I think of me, what, what you think of me, and it goes on and on and on. How can I experience God if other things are God? How can I experience God if I am God? Now, I'll never tell you I believe I'm God, but subtly I am. Just ask me quietly, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where I'm speaking. I'll tell you what I make for a living, what I do for a living, what I drive, where I live. I'll give you the whole resume. Just say hello to me. 
The complete opposite of that is having no partner, just answering the call, a life of invitation, which my Heavenly Father has given me, a life of invitation. And I speak for myself, and I, I'm not taking inventory on anyone, because some folks do this. Sometimes, and I notice in South Florida, they do a lot of anyone speaking anywhere they want us to support, and 40 hands go up. I never do that. I do this a lot. I'm not looking for attention. I'm not looking if people come. I'm pleased. But I don't need to raise my hand because I got support from God because he gave me an invitation to go speak. If there's one dirty smelling drunk in a cathedral and that's it, I'm given a talk. If there's 3,000 people like at some of the conferences, I'm given a talk. I was asked to go speak. I don't get involved with any of that. Because all I have to do with my mind, and it is a disease of this mind, is pay attention to that for just a little second and worry about what's there, who's there, what it's going to look like. That is a snowball going down the hill. And by the end of it, I'm killed. It turns into an avalanche. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol. Life might become unmanageable. I'm an alcoholic. Drunk or sober cannot manage my own life. Drunk or sober, my seeking God. God could and would if he was sought. I can't manage my own life, drunk or sober, regardless of how long I'm sober as well. That's a statement for all of us. Am I trying to manage my life? You know, the drugs, the alcohol, God, you take care of that. But leave the sex and the money. I got that. Don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I've been divorced, married and divorced 75 times, but God, I got it. Don't worry about it. It's a couple of things in, in, in when we come out of step one where we're, we're Hopefully we're at our gut level where we're clear that anything I do is going to blow up. And step one's going to tell a guy like me that I'm drinking, regardless of what you put in front of me, that appears good. I'll get drunk on the greatest day. I'll get drunk on the worst day. I'll get drunk on any day. I'm getting drunk. That's what step one tells me. And we have 43 pages that drill this home because they knew someone like me was coming into AA, and you couldn't just tell me one time. You had to give me 43 pages and say, Pete, you're powerless. Paint into a corner, you're screwed. You're drinking until you die. No matter what you think you're going to do, you're drinking. And when I'm completely at a loss and I, my hands are handcuffed and there's no way to turn, I turn to God and they present step two, which is introduced to me on page 45 in, in chapter two, agnostics, which is how I came into AA, an agnostic. I knew there was a God out there somewhere. You just can't prove its existence to me. I can't touch it. I can't see it. So right now, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. But I'm going to pray. And many of us are like that. We believe there's something out there. But during our day, our eight-hour work day, our 15 hours roaming around and before we hit the, the, the pillow at night, we're doing what we're doing. And then we hit on his God, oh, please forgive me. Do it. Keep me clean. So we start all over again. It really isn't so much, although vitally important, what I do when I'm on my knees. It's when I get up off my knees and I get out and interact with you. If I really have a God. I'm in church every Sunday morning. It's a great thing. One of the greatest things that's happened to me in my life. But when I leave Mass at around 11.30 in the morning, and it's a quarter to 12, and the parking lot's packed and no one's getting out, and I'm on Federal Highway, all the northerners are down here, and they're crowding up the streets. And I want to go to Publix to go shopping, and everybody on the planet is in Publix, and I just want to get in and get out to go home and watch football. How am I doing? How am I doing? That's when it really counts. That's why I go into prayer, not to navigate through life, but to release all of that and experience God to go through it. But the mind is never done. And in, in chapter 2, Gnostics, the most powerful word for me is lack of power was our dilemma. Lack of power is my dilemma. I don't have power, which means I don't have choice to control over anything. I might think I can influence you. I might think I can control you, but I don't. I'm playing God when I do that. And I certainly can't control what I'm going to do. Everything goes through the Father. And if I'm aligned with God's will, suddenly I'm able to wear the world like a loose garment. But that requires dedication and commitment from me because after a while the heat that's on our backside when we come in here I got to get away from this terrible life I'm leaving that kind of cools down and we get comfortable and then we find him or her which becomes God and meetings become second and third and he or she becomes first 
It's all the mind doing what the mind does. There's a couple of spots in the book that, that play with, that talk about the mind for us. First of all, it says the main problem for people like us centers in the mind, not the body. That's a step two consideration. Am I convinced that my main problem's in the mind, not the body? The body reacts to anything my mind tells it. My mind says, go pick up a drink. I pick up a drink and I can't stop drinking. And then I blame you for getting me drunk. It talks about willpower becomes practically non-existent. So I say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to stay sober tomorrow. I'll stop Monday. I'm going to get really drunk tonight and then start nice and clean tomorrow. One more time. Willpower becomes practically non-existent. In fact, it says the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. All from the mind. It tells me I'm without defense against the first drink. The almost certain consequences that follow even taking a glass of beer. Don't crowd into my mind to deter me. If these thoughts occur, it says they're readily in, uh, supplanted with the old threadbare idea, foolish idea, that somehow I can drink safely. This is what we battle after we're separated from the booze. And what I learned, which ruffles some feathers, being physically separated from alcohol or the substance has little to do with being recovered. It just means we're separated. I've been locked up a bunch of times. Wait a couple of days to see a judge. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't sponsorship material. Right? <laughs> I would be in treatment. I was in treatment once for nine weeks. I got drunk two days later. Nine weeks in treatment. My body was clean and sober. My mind was still dirty. My mind had delusions of grandeur, and I'm a low life, both battling both demons on both sides. And the only way I, I can shut any of that down is just give me a double. Give me a Jack Daniels. I'm good. Let it go down. Voice to start to shut down. Suddenly, I'm a good guy again. And all the dirt get wash, get, gets washed away. One of the words I used, even in therapy, when I would talk to a sponsor, or talk to my therapist, or even when I was in treatment, for way back when, was I always felt dirty on the inside. I'm a mistake. Who am I kidding? But dirty is the best adjective I can describe. And when I drank alcohol, I didn't feel dirty anymore. I felt good about me. That's why I drank. I liked the effect produced by alcohol. But the problem is once I start drinking, I can't stop drinking. In fact, I don't even know when I'm going to stop, when I'm going to stop. It determines that. My mind's in charge of that. And all because I have a separation or a feeling of separation from this power. And what needs to be done is this purging, this complete emptying out, a metanoia, a complete upheaval. Everything goes out. And what it's replaced with is a godlike mind that we get in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're moved by spirit, no more driven by the mind. That's freedom. That requires action. I need to do some things here. It tells me in the big book, when this sort of thinking is fully established, this sort of thinking is fully established, I place myself beyond human aid. So the love of my own children, the love of my spouse, uh, my job, my boss, even the law giving me warnings, the emotional appeal, self suffice is not going to work. I'm drinking. That's been my experience as a real alcoholic, the drunk on page 21. So I'm very grateful God has brought me to a place of seeking God and doing all the things I get to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It talks about a grave emotional mental disorder in the chapter five how it works. Restore me to sanity and that I have a grave emotional mental disorder. That sounds like psych patients. Grave emotional mental disorder. Sanity. Insanity. What's this? this I'm a drunk. What does this have to do with me? Everything to do with me. My grave emotional mental disorder is that my mind wants to take me back to that which is killing me over and over and over again. And after a while, for folks who've been around here, it's not the drink on the front. The drink is in the back. It's coming in through the side door. What it is, is paying attention to the voices in the head again. They're going to take me down dark alleys and places I shouldn't be, making inappropriate behavior very appropriate because I need something to feel okay in here. 
I just need something or someone. I need something out there rather than God because I'm twisted up again. And it's very subtle drip. I love the analogy. I've used this many times when you go in the water and you, you know you kind of leave your beach chair here and you go in the water and you play around in the ocean. You make a U-turn to come back to your beach chair and you can't find it. You find out it's way over there. You've drifted. The little currents in the water pull you and pull you and pull you and you didn't even feel it. Oh my God, I'm way over there. It happens in here in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just kind of drift. You don't need to write inventory. You saw me drifting last week in the water when we were down. You keep drifting. I don't need to call a sponsor. I don't want to go to that meeting. I don't have to write inventory. I got to work. I'm very busy. I, I, I can't meet my sponsor. I can't read the Bible. I'm very busy. I'm a very busy life now. I'm sober. I have priorities. And then when we, one day we turn around, we're not drunk yet. But we're lost. And I don't know which feeling is worse, being an alcoholic synonymous, sober and lost, or just drunk. Both the bondage. And what, what, what blows my mind is we're in the meeting of alcoholic synonymous. We have 12 steps, 12 traditions. We have a big book. We have lots of information here for everyone in here to get free, completely free, freer than we are right now. And if we're in bondage, freedom from bondage, and yet we do other things, we write our own prescription plan. I did it and kept getting drunk. And when some of my teachers, when I came in in 1988, gave me information, I didn't like all of it. I just didn't question it. Kind of like when I'm sick now and I take an antibiotic, I don't like the side effects of antibiotic. It don't even taste good going down. But I know it's a necessary ingredient. And I'll ask the doctor, is there anything else I can do? No, take the medicine. I take it in a week, I feel better. I have so much information in front of me in the sacred rooms called Alcoholics Anonymous. So step two, when I come out of step one, it's a pointer to the solution. Not the solution, it's a pointer. We're going to go to this place of sanity, wholeness of mind, truth, God. Because that's the only thing that's going to relieve me of this, this thing that's going to kill me, alcoholism. Including the ism that accompanies alcoholism. All the behaviors, because this thing will go underground and resurface in other areas. I think it was last week I said, my first six months in AA, I looked like a drunken sailor without a drink in me. I was fearful, insecure, egotistical, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, acting out every which way possible. I developed an eating disorder. I thought I had other problems other than alcohol. I thought I was a psych patient. I was completely lost going to meetings. And I remember thinking, I don't want to go to meetings anymore. They don't work. I'm more twisted up now than when I got sober. What do I do? And I completely bottomed out. December 22nd, 1988. A drink was calling. I was getting thirsty. And thank the good Lord, a gentleman, I went to his house and he says, where are you with God in the 12 steps? I said, when did you stop the steps? He said, when you stop throwing up, you're late. He didn't care about my feelings. He wasn't about scaring a newcomer out because he knew booze was going to kick me in if I was lucky. So I got to look at step two, which is a pointer to the solution. And now I'm desperate. I need something to shut me down. I'm sick of blowing up. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired sober. It's an arrival place. Came to believe that a power ground myself could restore me to sanity. It's an arrival. I will get to a place. It's a guarantee in our book because step 10 says, you know, the problem, the, the problem's been removed. Sanity has returned. Step 10 gives us the, 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 the solution right in our lap. The contract gets delivered. Step 2 says, came to believe that a power greater myself could restore me to sanity. It's an arrival. If I need to be restored to sanity, where am I insane? And the obvious thing is I keep going back to a drink over and over and over again. It'll be different this time. I'll control and regulate. I'll control and enjoy. I try all the experimentation and it never works. And then I just keep drunk, drinking. My mind loves to have me feel hopeless where, who am I kidding? Just drink and get it over with. Just let's do this. You're never going to get sober. Who wants sobriety anyway? Got to go to church basements for the rest of my life? Let's just go down to the bar and get loaded. My mind would present that, that living in the back of an abandoned building hallway, Drinking Mr. Boston Blackberry Brand, it took me about two hours to, to, to panhandle for that money. 
go to the liquor store, get a jug, hold it close to me because it's more important than my own heart beating because if it falls, I'm screwed at the brakes, and tuck myself in the back of a hallway. I haven't bathed, I haven't eaten God knows how long, and just drink my liquor. My mind will say, that is good. Coming here is extreme. <laughs> Doing the steps, drinking in the back of a hallway. Let me get back to your 90 days. I'll work on my 90 and 90. So I get to a place of sanity, a wholeness of mind. But that's it's just the point of what am I going to do about that? How am I going to get there? Am I willing to let go of everything? In our big book in chapter 2, Gnostics, it tells me God's everything or else he is nothing. Everything means everything. And I really need to get clear on everything meaning everything because I'm about to let go in step 3. A great assignment to take a look at that I've done over and over and over again is I write on a sheet of paper things I'm not willing to give to God yet. And why? What am I not willing to give to God? And why? What's my fear? If I gave my money life to God, if I gave my relationship life to God, if I gave my food life, my diet life, my alcohol life to God, what am I afraid of? And I would list where I'm afraid of. Well, if I gave my money life to God, I might be really kind of poor the rest of my life. If I gave my relationship life to God, I might be celibate for the rest of my life. Maybe that's the calling. Well, we don't want to do any of this stuff, so I'll take over, and I'm going to hit a wall. And I get to look at my current agnosticism over and over and over again. Where do I think God's working in my life? Where do I think God is not working in my life? Little assignments just to see in black and white where I stand, where I currently am. Because you can ask me a question, I'll give you a profound answer. And you say, great, what a beautiful sponsee I got. But secretly, I don't mean any of it, because we're the best liars in the world. There's an old saying, when our lips are moving, we're lying. Newcomers don't like that, but that's the way it is, guys. So my sponsor had me do assignments like that. The truth will set us free, but it doesn't taste good all the time. So I worked through chapter 10 agnostics. It talks about how difficulty will arise when we approach a man or woman when we discuss God. Difficulty is going to arise. Uh, tension being the surface of spiritual truth. And what it does, it challenges me on everything I thought, felt, and believed in about God. What God's supposed to look like. Where God is, what religion God's really in with. Right? And I became a warring theologian. It challenged everything. Chapter Tignostics tells me how, where, and why to find God. I just need to be open and walk that path. But the difficulty that arises with someone like me, even though my mom took me to church as a kid and did a lot of religious things with me, did all the, the Catholic things, there was still difficulty within me when it came to God. And when I found out that the difficulty with God that arose with me, where I bristled with antagonism, was not God towards me, it was me towards God, based on my old perceptions and conceptions about this power. You know how many folks I know coming to AA who say, who are maybe Catholics, devout Catholics, Christians come into AA, and the big book says, your own understanding. Like God, you understand, is, oh, I'm out. It's too vague. It should be a Catholic God. It should be this particular person. And so I can't do this. And I asked them, how many times did you worship while you were chasing a drink? And if it was between praying to this power that you're, that you're claiming and a drink, who were you going to? That was your God, not God. Well, the simple one is, why do I come to AA? This is what they did with me because I had lots of God problems. The difficulty was me towards God. They said, you come to AA. Yes, why? To stay away from a drink. And who's, who are you going to see? A group of drunks? I said, yeah. And are they going to give you good only direction? I said, yeah. So you got a G-O-D, group of junks for good only direction. That was my higher power at the beginning. I felt safe around you guys, especially old timers. You know, guys with 30, 40 years would sit in the back and they'd call me, hey, kid, come over. Then they would remember your name. It was like, oh, my God, Shangri-La. You know, old-timer Mike knows my name. <laughs> and I'll get it through like osmosis, you know. There was a meeting uh, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, St. Finbar Church. I can't remember the, the winner's group on a Saturday night. 
And there was a handful of old timers in the back of the room. They'd always sit in the same corner. And I'd come down and after, after a few months of this, they would say hello to me. And then, uh, uh, uh old man Frank, who was going blind, he said, he, he called, hey kid, they call my name, come sit with us. And I was right in the middle of all of these guys. I was not thinking about a drink. They weren't big book guys. They were just good old timers. Who told me, Marion always talks about this, told me how to get through life. They gave me great lessons on how to stay away from a drink. But they were all grounded with God. And they were always doing 12-step calls. That's how I learned how to do 12-step calls. They were my higher power. And in early sobriety, even though I was starting to develop a relationship with God and kind of getting closer and closer, so many times I would have to get to a meeting just to feel you guys around me, felt safe around you guys. I was sober a bunch of years, and I had a job uh, uh, in Texas, and it just blew up. And I was completely lost, rudderless. And it was a Saturday morning, and I was weeping on this, on this, on this bench outside of a diner, wondering, where am I going with this life? And a bunch of AA guys who were very close to me came and got me, and we said, let's go to a meeting. And I just had to be around drunks. I had to be around drunks with a rotten cup of coffee in a smelly church basement. It was Park Avenue for me. So a group of junks for good old direction. That's why I love our folks, and that's why it's sacred. Because if we're twisted up, and I'm twisted up, and I raise my hand, I will get good old direction from someone. The neat thing about being on this path is those twisted up days seem to be few and far between. I'm not perfect. I make a ton of mistakes, and I have my stuff. But I'm not twisted up every day like I was when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, huh? I need to be restored to sanity, which means I'm insane somewhere. And after a while, it's not just a drink, it's other things I'm doing. Am I willing to turn everything over to God? Because that set me up to step three, which tells me at this point I'm going to, about to make a decision, turn my will, my thinking, and my actions over to God, and my life is totally none of my business anymore. That's a big proposition for many of us. That's why the more hope, a big book tells us the more hopeless we feel, the better. The more hopeless I am, the better. It doesn't feel good, but it's a great thing because I'm convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that anything, anytime I drive, we crash. I'm not doing it anymore. Hmm? On page 52, it talks about the bedevilments. <laughs> This is while I'm sober. More on manageability, you know, I'm coming to AA meetings and I'm not drinking. I can still experience unmanageability if I'm lacking a relationship with God. And for me to have a relationship with God, I need to experience the, re the depth of self, the removal of me. It says we were having trouble in personal relationships, couldn't control our emotional nature, prey to misery and depression, couldn't make a living, I had a feeling of uselessness, I'm full of fear, I'm unhappy, and I can't seem to be of real help to other people. I'm not talking about the occasional day where you get fear, where you just kind of lethargic, and you're kind of not, not on the beam that day. This becomes a way of life day after day after day, and we learn how to mask it. We're completely twisted up until we walk into an A meeting and I, the U.S. me, I'm doing, I'm saying, I'm great. Everything's great. I mean, I'm good. But really, secretly, I'm dying. But the ego has reemerged. The selfish and self-seeking ways, I learned how to mask that. I'm involved in gossip and backstabbing and I justify it. I critique people all the time. This is all part of my untreated alcoholism. I don't like hearing the truth. Nowadays, thank the good Lord, when I'm on the phone with my sponsor on Wednesday night, he's given me truth, and sometimes I don't like it, but I appreciate it. When I'm twisted up, I don't want to take the call anymore. I make an excuse not to call. But my life depends upon someone giving me truth. Page 53 tells me, when I became an alcoholic crushed by a self-imposed crisis, I couldn't postpone or evade. I had to fearlessly face the proposition that God is, every, God, uh, is everything or else he is nothing. Where am I going to go now? There's no wiggle room here. 
Is God everything or nothing? Even when things don't appear to be going my way. Alcoholism will go underground and resurface in other areas. I will be sober going to AA meetings, even have a sponsor. Claim to be working the steps, but I have a secret sex life. I'm full of fear. I'm not honest with my money. I have no integrity when it comes to finances. I have no integrity when it comes to business. I go on sprees, food sprees, thinking sprees, sex sprees, money sprees, gym sprees, tanning sprees, thinking sprees, sprees, anything, because I can't be alone with me on the couch and no one around because the mind is twisting me up. So I need to go something to experience some relief. That's untreated alcoholism. I've experienced that. My first six months in AA, I was chasing my tail. because I like trying to outrun my own shadow. And after a while, I grew, it was a rude awakening for me that meetings don't treat that. It's a band-aid on an open wound, but meetings alone are not going to treat that. I'll get some relief for now. At some point, I need to go into the bunker with the big book and a notepad and a sponsor and do all the things I'm asked to experience this power. And I come out of there at some point feeling lighter and freer and not attached to what my mind's telling me. Again, the sense of who I be does not come from my mind or thought. It comes from God. And God already has the, the pathway laid out. It's already in front of me. It's just been cluttered with me and all of my belief system that I acquired. Whether it was given to me by loving parents or I bought it from others. But it's there. And it's messy. And the ego wants no part of it. The ego wants to insist that I'm right and you're wrong. The ego wants to defend what it knows and defend what it doesn't. Anything to keep God away from my life. And that is the uncomfortability. When I'm going through the steps, or I'm getting the truth from a sponsor, or I'm doing inventory at night, and I'm getting uncomfortable, all that's happening is the ego is getting grinded into dust, and we'd really not like not to do this stuff. We'd just rather stay away from it. So sometimes we talk about step two, and we think it just applies to drinking, and it does. But what about when we're around here a little while? What sort of current unmanageability am I experiencing in Alcoholics Anonymous? What's that look like? Am I still having a, a, the gift of desperation, even though I'm here five or ten years? Do I like the effect produced by God? I would write down... My old conception of God, what it was like growing up with this power called God. So I can touch where I am with God. And I would write down a lot of things about my old conception of God growing up. Basically what my parents told me, what my grandparents told me. God is a white guy with a white beard, he's got blue eyes, he lives up there somewhere, some cloud. And that might be true. I don't know, can't discount that, I've never been there. And as I started getting old, I had some other ideas about God. And when I was drunk, I had real ideas about God. And it went from this guy who's still going to take care of me to this cruel jokester who wants no part of me. And then I write down where I was currently, sober and AA. Where am I currently? What's my current idea of God, my current conception of God? What does that look like? And the last assignment was the best. How I would like to have a relationship with God in the future. What would that be? If I can create a God, if I can create a relationship with God, what would that look like? What would that feel like? And I wrote down this God of all love and forgiveness. This teacher. This uh, omnipotent power, but a loving power. And that was my goal, to experience something like this. And I would hear the elders in AA talk about this loving God. I just wasn't there yet. Little by slowly, I woke up one day and found this powerful, loving, forgiving, gentle, pushing, steering, guiding father who will discipline me in a loving way, have compassion and forgiveness for me. And when I'm in that place, my mind is not telling me to drink anymore. My mind's not telling me to go use powdered goods anymore. My mind's not telling me to go act out anymore. All of that stuff's been removed. And when the carpenter says we're the world like a loose garment, I know what he's talking about. Many of us know what he's talking about because the mind is no longer God. God is God. And I get moved by the Spirit. A book talks about uh, 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 being rocketed. It talks about this fourth dimension. What are they talking about? 
I've been, for the longest time, living in three dimensions. I worship my emotions, my compulsions, and my obsessions. Those are my gods. And our book talks about going past all of those three, transcending all of that. The divine life, we transcend the human order. We go to this other place that emotions, compulsions, obsessions are no longer in, don't longer have me in their grip. I'm living along the line of God. And the stuff that goes on down here, sure, we get pushed around by it. It just doesn't own me. And my mind is now taking a back seat. Imagine walking around without thinking for one day. Now the first question would be, well, how could I not think? Yeah, you can do fine without thinking. How's thinking working out for you? Here's what I do when I think. I have a winning Powerball ticket in my hand. After I finish jumping up and down for an hour, my mind says, oh, they're all going to come want money from you. Suddenly I have friends I didn't know. I have to move. I have to get the house secured. They'll kidnap my family. Oh, my God, got to move. Don't tell me. And you stop. You stop. Mind doesn't stop. That's what thinking does for me. So am I clear that this power can restore me to center? Am I willing to go there? Am I willing to go to any lens to experience this power? And when I am, we step into step three, which means I made a decision. It's just a decision to turn everything over to this power for God. Am I willing to take that leap? Am I willing to go there? And so what I did with the third step uh, prayer was, I wrote down on a sheet of paper the third step prayer as it appears in the big book. And then I wrote down my interpretation of the third step prayer. What does it say to me? What does it mean to me? I still do that. So this prayer, all the information in the book, all this book has to become, get internalized. I have to be the book. The book has to be me rather than just words on a page. And so that's what I would do. Page 62 in the big book talks about us, talks about me. It says selfishness, self-centeredness. That, I think, is the root of our troubles. Where are roots on a tree underground? You can't see them. It masks itself really well. My selfishness and self-centeredness underground, you can't see them. Well, I'll front really well, but secretly i got other things going on. That's how many of us operate. We have to be ripped out, Bill says, root and branch, and placed in new soil. The whole thing has to go. It says, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows, and they retaliate. They get back at us. And I do. Why are you doing that to me for? I'm gossiping about you for six months, and then you stop talking to me. And I say, you believe this one? (laughs) Until I do inventory, and I say, oh my God, I owe you an amends. No wonder why you don't talk to me. But my mind won't let me see that. Because I'm selfish and self-centered to the core. It says sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that sometime in the past I made a decision based on me which placed me in a position to be hurt. My troubles are of my own making. Unmanageability is always an internal condition, never an external one. It's how I see the world. It's how I hear the world. It's how I speak to you. It's always an internal condition, unmanageability. The way I handle problems 25 years ago is a lot different than the way I handle problems in life now. One was without God, one walks with God. Unmanageability, always an internal condition. And my book tells me I had to be rid of self. I had to quit playing God. I'm in the world to play the role God assigns. What I've done for years, many of us, is I played God. I assign you a role, I assign you a role, I assign God a role, I assign me a role, and I'm in collision with everyone, and my book is saying we got to let this go. You're not God. It says we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. And it's subtle how we do that. Like when I walked in and I saw the rose crooked, playing God, James, you got to straighten the room out. This should be this way and that should be that way. Who am I? Maybe it's supposed to be this way. Maybe we're not supposed to be in the other room. We're supposed to be in here. Maybe next week we go back. Maybe next week we're in the parking lot. None of my business. <laughs> Quit playing God. And part of that is now like when I sponsor guys and they bottom out. I mean, you try to prevent that and make them aware, but sometimes people just got to bottom out. 
It's not for me to keep them in a nice warm blanket and prevent the bottom. We'll do everything you can, but if you're going to go, go. <laughs> or I'm going to play God, and I have the power to keep you from drinking. I have the power to keep you from going on a spree. You're going, you're going. I'll be here to pick you up when you're done. My grand sponsor said, let them bop till they drop. You're not God. He's the principal. We're his agents. As an agent, we represent the principal. LeBron James has an agent. LeBron James is the principal. That agent goes out and represents LeBron James. Gets a whole bunch of deals, puts them on a table, and LeBron says yes and no. We are agents for God. Are you telling me now we represent God? Absolutely. That's what we do. We represent God. Our book tells us that, not me. We're agents for God. He's the principal. We're his agents. That's exactly what it says. I have a huge responsibility. I represent God, not only in AA. This is easy. This is like going to church and being religious for an hour. It's when we're out there and life's coming at us. Life is problematic. Life will come at us. Things will happen. How am I doing? Am I showing you a good agent for God? I may be the only copy of the big book someone ever reads. He's the father, we're his children. Unconditional love will give me everything I need if I keep close to him and perform his work well. How am I doing with his work? If I don't do God's work, God's not going to punish me. I just can't hear it. I'm not in touch with God. I'm in touch with me and my ego, me and my pride, me and my defects of character. If we kept close to this power, and they don't mean proximity. There's no such thing as proximity when it comes to God. God is the breath that breathes through me. Closer than my own breath. But there's a feeling of separation. If we perform his work well, he'll provide me, provide us with what we need to get through this life. All the things we need, whatever it is. And I won't if I don't. I won't experience that. God could have, would have, he was sort of, am I going to seek this power? And when I'm ready, what we would do is get on our knees. I do with the men I sponsor now. As my sponsor does with me, my sponsor have done with me in the past. We get on our knees and we hold hands and we say the third step prayer together. It's a very sacred moment. I remember the first time I did that, my sponsor, we got on our knees and held hands. I was like, what, is, what did I get into? It was awkward. I was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. But I, I remember I opened my eyes and looked at him and his eyes were closed and he was there. I said, I want what this guy's got, so I'm going to do what he's doing. Closed my eyes, held on to his hands, we did the third step prayer. And when we got up off our knees, he says, now, here's the good news. Your life is no longer any of your business. And we began step four, because my book says, next, we lost out of the course of vigorous action. I have to turn everything over to this power. And it's just a decision. Too many times I've heard people work in the first three steps in our contemporary middle of the road meetings. Work the first three steps. Get a good third step. You're not ready to jump. Don't do the four steps. Stay in step three. Keep turning it over. Read the 12 and 12 every day for the next six months. <sighs> I'm bleeding to death, and you're telling me to stay here. Step three is, yes, I'm ready to go. Step four, go. Because it's somewhere in four through nine that I will access this. I will experience God. And I'm totally out of time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.